I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'll be uh, moderating tonight. Uh, it looks like our speaker hasn't shown up yet for the uh, college, so we're going to have a backup program on gun control. I'm sure between me and Charlie we'll have a really good thing. If he shows up, we'll turn over the mic to him right away. But. Anyway, let the College of Complexes consist of the following format. Our speakers speak. We then have a question and answer period. Then we have the infamous rebuttal period. But part of our program tonight may be a little bit more on the winging it side. We'll see what happens. Let's uh, welcome Charlie as a backup speaker tonight, Mr. Charlie Paydock. <laughs> Um, actually, uh, to give you a little background, if you come to my office downtown, behind me is a commendation from the Illinois Coalition Against Handguns, um, uh, recognizing my efforts that started about 25 years ago uh, regarding guns that so covered a lot of the issues over the years. The basic one is, of course, you have the First Amendment uh, that guarantees the right to have arms. If in the event, uh, for the purpose of serving in a militia, now the way they ruled that later and for, for decades was that if the National Guard furnished you with weapons that precluded you from having one by yourself. Since the, if the military provided you with a weapon, there was no need to keep one in your house because people didn't bring their own guns. Um, now there's some other legal hassles in here. The castle doctrine, one is good self-defense is a God-given right. I don't know. I hear this from libertarians. I'm not too certain. I, I don't think it can be verified that there is a, a God who confers rights. And no right is ever exercised in the absolute. So yes, they can in fact, and, uh, and, and I mean that all rights, including free speech, and some of these other inalienable rights that you may maintain are unlimited, are in fact very much constrained, such as free speech. In, in, let's say where you work, you certainly cannot say what you want with impunity anytime to, to anybody where you work. So when you cross the portal of, of the workplace, your rights, your free speech rights are impinged. Same thing with uh, guns at work. Uh, I don't think there's any places of employment that consonants having weapons at work. Uh, I could be wrong in that regard. But even with concealed carry type legislation, and most employers preclude you uh, from having a weapon on the place of employment. And obviously, there have been you're familiar with the situations where individuals have gone postal. Now, one of the things about having a right, people claim there's another one that's kind of I. None of this is the music, but this one I've always found the music. It's the fact that if we have gun control or even gun confiscation, that the United States will turn into a totalitarian nation. And there's also stories told that the first thing uh, the Nazis did in Germany in the 30s was to affect gun control and take all the weapons. Um, more seriously, that people could have resisted Hitler had they had weapons. Well, there's one thing about the citizen army, 
and taking on a regular army. Now, General Eisenhower, when he planned battles, he never took on the German army, Wehrmacht, unless he had a two-to-one advantage. When it came to, to conducting warfare, the Germans were very good at this. And to say that civilians could have defeated them, to me, is improbable or likely. When they were up against a well-equipped and trained militaries, the United States and Britain and other countries, and they are formidable. It's unlikely that civilians under any circumstances uh, could put up much of a fight. Now there are some things that warfare in the third world now, they're putting up a pretty good fight, but that's only for a limited period of time. And only with, I think, if you have some outside source of supply, what have you. So that's not really a citizen's army by any means. It's a, it's a surrogate army, your legitimate army. Now the one example that comes up um, is, um, I have a right to have guns in my house and protect myself. Um, well, the, which takes precedent? Your right to safety or the rights of the community to be safe. Now, I always bring up the example and I, in my emails, uh, the example of my loony neighbor with weapons. And he's posing a threat to the rest of the community. Now, is his personal safety more important than the, than the safety of the community? Uh, that's what I mean. Um, so what do you do under those circumstances? Now I was arguing with the fellow during the week. He thought it was totally appropriate to teach. He taught us three children yet. And he, he taught each of them. They, they were trained on how to, look, how to lock and load and use weapons and use them with accuracy. And so not only do I have a loony neighbor, but I have to contend at any given occasion with his three loony children who may cause me harm. Uh, this guy had all sorts of arguments for training children. Oh, now this is the other one I like. Guns are okay if you get training. Or if kids can have guns, if you give them training. Well, you can't say that. If, 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 let's, we've discussed a lot of social issues here at the college. And it, the solution, like the progressives, to social problems was education. And you can just say, well, the solution to uh, prejudice against minorities is, is they, they need better or different kinds of education and they won't be prejudiced anymore. Or suddenly you take a person and you give them gun training and suddenly they're perfectly safe and everything is okay. And they're, they're, they pose no threat to you. So, that's not the case. I don't need that. Oh, you, you can go. I, I'm not going to get into their stuff. I'm just covering kind of general issues. Thanks. Okay. Um, but um, training, training aid in the safety, possibly more towards the personal safety of the, the person with the gun than how it's used. There's one thing like children. I'm sorry, children don't have, you cannot inculcate or, 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 or transfer maturation. 
young people simply don't have the maturity to use guns or to be given a gun and to make decisions if or not they should be used. And there's no course that in, can inculcate uh, maturation. The decisions on that, are, and it's never going to happen. I'm sorry. I don't. I don't think most adults should be handling weapons or qualified, let alone young people. That's just. There's no argument that I could find that would sustain that whatsoever. Um, so that's it. Now the other thing is. Um, I, I've had some personal experiences with weapons. I lived in rural areas for many, many years. And um, to some of the things, that like personal experiences that came to mind, I was driving a bookmobile and I still remember seeing a couple kids that are like 13 years old with guns out hunting. And I got to say, you know, this, I just didn't feel safe after that. This is not a good idea. I mean, we have a couple little kids that are up there, just barely make 13 with weaponry out there. The other thing is weapons, uh, people think like you see on TV, you see a guy and you shoot him in the belly, right? Well, bullets travel very far. They can, they can travel a mile or two. Um, living in the country, I nearest neighbor was about a mile or so, and I was in the backyard and the trees above, uh, the branches above me started falling off. And immediately ascertained, and it wasn't that it was fall weather or anything like this, but it was the neighbor kids on the neighboring property half a mile away or so. We were out having some gunplay, some fun. And there were other tragic incidences. Yeah, this has happened more than once. Um, you have, like on hunting season, it was very dangerous to go out because you had a lot of people who were anxious to shoot a deer and weren't, weren't experienced city folk. And it was variably, this happened on more than one occasion, that instead of get bagging a deer, they managed to shoot a tractor on a farm, a farmer on a tractor. Ooh. So these things happen. Now we've had some problems in the city. I, I don't know the, the classic arguments. Um, they, I, I would like to have ideal situation of gun-free zones. Um, now, there was a thing in concealed carry. I have a brochure back there, and you can follow the rules on this. And they're still being kicked around, as far as I know, on whether you can have concealed carry or not. There's cases coming up. Um, but no sooner, I don't know if any of you have a much occasion to go downtown or public buildings and things like this but if you see many many buildings um, you uh, will see the sticker that no weaponry is allowed in those buildings uh, there's other things about bringing weapons on modes of transportation and without going into detail you can I testify against having weapons, people allowed to bring weapons on CTA, uh, which technically you cannot do right now, despite concealed carry legislation. Uh, it's something like you can bring a gun, but it has to be dissembled in a box, and put in a box. Um, uh, Canadians don't allow whatsoever. Uh, if you go through their transit terminals, uh, there are signs that tell you flat out there's no weaponry allowed. In the United States, uh, the NRA was trying to allow people uh, to bring weapons on Amtrak. Uh, they didn't succeed except that you can put it in the baggage car. Uh, but you're not going to wear it 
or carry it with you into the passenger coaches and things like that. I'm trying to think what other areas might interest you guys on guns. I'm ready to go. Uh, all right, uh, that kind of covers it. I, no doubt you've seen the statistics. We do have an issue with guns in, in our city. Uh, there was uh, this thing about the presidential candidate was going around saying Chicago was in fact the most dangerous city in the United States. It's actually ranked seriously for gun violence about the past two years. You'll find places like New Orleans are, are much worse. The other thing I came across about violence and gun violence is um, this was this was just last week I came across this. The um, city of El Paso has a transit line going with um, the, the neighboring Mexican city. And the president of the United States was saying, oh, there's all these gangs. This is the other thing. Gangs, gangs are the only ones that do violence. But uh, the, the president was saying there's these bad hombres. Well, as it turns out, El Paso, for four years in a row, I think has been the safest city in the United States. So in terms of this, Bad hombre stuff, uh, you know. Uh, no, it's a safe city here. Juarez. Juarez. It is the city, like yeah, right, right across the board, but, but, but it's uh, known for violence. Hmm? It's known for pretty hefty violence. Well, I don't know. No, it's Juarez and Rome. <laughs> was, I'm not that I know for sure. That was the gist of the article. That it's been ranked not not a bad place, and they made that perfectly clear that it's not okay. a dangerous place. Um, yeah, I know there's some reputation like Tijuana or TJ or something like that, but you have to wonder about that. I'm trying. To, oh, uh, the other thing is on these. Um, I don't like to get into it, but there's been. Um, you get in the whole world of statistics. And I never send an email about a tragic accident with guns or a school shooting or a mass shooting because there's virtually no end to these. Um, somebody came along and it's been a while since I looked at the figures, but if you count a mass shooting of at least three to five people, that's how you define it. There is at least one someplace in the United States every week. And it's been going on like that for several years, I think three years. Now, if there's, I don't know what the gun community has to offer outside of more weaponry and training to reverse this trend. But it's, and there's some other statistics out there that aren't very pleasant. It's like several, nine, eight or nine children a day or so, markets stand corrected, get shot in the United States every day, or every week or something like that. Whatever it is, I don't remember. Okay. But the figures are alarming. And these are, uh, that's what I mean. You have guys like this. Now the other thing, there are certain groups, one that's quite active are Illinois Moms Against Guns that I've been kind of active with. Um, one of the things they were doing is, and they were serious about this, is that if you don't let your children play with other children who have access to guns, so that you're, you're only foolish, they're endangering your own child. Uh, there was another one similar to this, as the people felt they shouldn't get vaccinations for children, so the, they were saying, don't socialize or deal with anyone who maintains this anti-vaccination rules like this. Okay. All right, is that it? Thank you very much. Sir. All right, now. Oh, boy, Charlie. I think I did all right. Yeah, <laughs> I covered the high points of your bought Juarez and everything.
I am going to go in right now with some statistics from the GradyCampaign.org website. We're going to first start off with every day on average, zero, ages zero through nine. Every day, 48 children and teens are shot in murders, assaults, suicides, and suicide attempts, unintentional shootings, and police intervention. Every day, seven children and teens die from gun violence. Four are murdered, two kill themselves. Every day, 40 children and teens are shot and survive. 32 shot in an assault, one survives a suicide attempt, eight are shot unintentionally. Asking the simple question is an important step every parent can take to keep their child safe and possibly their kids' lives. Now, we go to all ages every day, 309 people in America are shot in murders, assaults, suicides, and suicide attempts, unintentional shootings, and police intervention. Every day, 93 people die from gun violence. 32 are murdered, 58 kill themselves, one are killed unintentionally, one is killed by police intervention, one intent is unknown. Every day, 216 people are shot and survive. 159 in an assault, 11 survive a suicide attempt, 43 are shot unintentionally, and three are shot in police intervention. In one year on average, 17,012 American children and teens are shot in murders, assaults, suicides, suicide attempts, unintentional shootings, or by police intervention. 2,647 kids die from gun violence. 1,565 children and teens are murdered. 907 children and teens kill themselves. 27 are killed by police intervention. 32 die, but the intent was unknown. 14,365 kids survive gun injuries. 11,321 are injured in an attack. 231 survive a suicide attempt. 2,447 are shot unintentionally and 65 are shot by a policeman. In America, one out of three homes with kids having guns and nearly 1.7 million children live in a home with an unlocked loaded gun. Talking about the danger to the children and firearms is not enough. In one year, all ages, 114,944 people in America are shot in murders, assaults, suicides, suicide attempts, unintentional shootings of police intervention. 11,564 are murdered. 21,037 people kill themselves. 544 are killed by police intervention. I'm sorry, 468 are killed by police intervention. 267 die, but intent is not known. 81,114 people survived gun injuries. 60,041 people are injured in an attack. 3,700 people survive a suicide attempt. 16,428 people are shot unintentionally. 947 people are shot by police interventions. And it goes on and on and on in the Brady sheet. I did come across the following article, though, from Australia, which has had 20 years of gun control Australia marked the 20th anniversary of a mass shooting which led to strict gun controls that in turn have led to a huge decline in gun murders, undermining the claim that claims in the United States that such curbs are not an answer. The chances of being murdered by a gun in Australia plunged from 0.35 per 100,000 people in 2014 from 0.54 per 100,000 people in 1996, a decline of 72%. A Reuters analysis of the Australian Bureau of Statistics showed. In 1996, a, in 1996, Australia, I'm sorry here, had 311 murders of which 98 were with guns. In 2014, with the population up from 18 million to 23 million, Australia had 238 murders, of which 35 were with guns. It was the April 28, 1996 shooting deaths by a lone gunman of 35 people in and around a cafe at a historic former prison colony in Tasmania that prompted the government to buy back or compensate 
a million firearms and make it harder to buy new ones. The country has had no mass shootings since. The figures directly contradict assertions made by of most leading U.S. presidential candidates who have either questioned the need to toughen gun laws or directly denounced Australia's go. laws as dangerous. In the January 2015 tweet, Republican frontrunner Donald Trump wrote back, the tighter the gun laws, the more violence. The criminals will always have guns. A year later, Republican hopeful Ted Cruz had blamed America's gun laws on the rise of sexual assault. Democratic frontrunner Hillary Clinton was meanwhile ruled out an Australian-style gun buyback, while Democrat Bernie Sanders rejected the need for even tougher gun controls, despite a gun murder rate of 3.4 per 100,000. The U.S. National Rifle Association has attacked the Australian laws as not the definition of common sense. Philip Alpers, an associate editor of Australia's University of Sydney School of Public Health, who studies gun ownership and violence, said Australia's gun laws have had demonstrable success. We have the most comprehensive suite of gun laws in the world and would be a great shame to start winning those down, he said. Remember, this is about six months old, this article. Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull marked the anniversary by saying the U.S. gun law, gun violence, showed why Australia would keep its laws intact. The rate of U.S. gun deaths shows what happens when you have very little, if any, restrictions on weapons like that, he told the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. If we go back to the Brady site, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here on what we can do. And one of the solutions that Brady, that the Brady things have, have done is they have several campaigns. The uh, first one, let's see here, help keep guns out of the wrong hands. Only a handful of states have expanded the Brady background checks. They need to finish a job. Every year, over 100,000 people are victims of gun violence in the U.S. More than 32,000 of these victims die. To combat these unacceptable numbers, we have an ambitious goal to cut the gun deaths in half by 2025. They want to address the issue through policy, legal action, public health and safety, and to achieve this goal, they need you to join their organization. The first thing is finish the job. Since the Brady Law took effect in 1994, over 2.4 million prohibited purchases have been blocked and countless lives have been saved. But today, only 60% of sales are covered by the Brady background checks. That is why we need the law, change the laws, and keep the kinds out of hands, felons, domestic abusers, and dangerous individuals. Two, stop bad apple gun dealers. Did you know that 90% of crime guns came from just 5% of the gun dealers? These bad apple gun dealers may be a small number, but have a large and tragic impact. We are determined to hold these gun dealers accountable and get and keep the guns out of the hand. I'm sorry. And get crimes and get crime guns off the streets by changing the gun industry. Guns in the home are a major public health risk, and to fix it, we must take a public health approach. In a country where nearly 1.7 million children live with an unlocked loaded gun contributing to the nine children and teens who are shot unintentionally each day, it would be time to change the culture. Is there an unlocked gun where my child plays? In a lot of ways. The other thing that you need to do is, there's a lot more in here at the Brady Solution to prevent gun violence. Another thing you might want to do, like what we're doing here today, is basically speak up. Students, uh, they have a first off, in four out of five shootings, at least one person has knowledge of the attacker's plan. They have just had a hotline put in called Speak Up, where yes, students sir. can safely and honestly report suspected threats 24 hours a day, seven days a week, by calling 1-866-SPEAK-UP. Speak Up empowers students with an unprecedented resource for preventing violence in their schools and communities. Students can safely and anonymously report suspected threats 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The hotline is staffed by trained counselors who handle the threat reports according to a protocol developed in collaboration with, with leading experts in law enforcement and education, although the hotline provides the mechanism through which students can, re 
report potentially life-saving information, it is critical that students are provided with the motivation to do so. Our comprehensive public awareness campaign works to combat destructive social norms, such as the fear of retaliation or being labeled a snitch. The campaign sends a powerful message that students should speak up against violence. The Speak Up Hotline has received over 40,000 calls since its inception, leading to the prevention of numerous acts of violence. To learn more information about Speak Up, visit the website at www.speakup.org. And there's a lot of other solutions in here. You can also suicide proof your home. And then they also have something called the Legal Action Project, which is what they're doing. They're working to reduce gun violence to the courts. For over 25 years, the British Center's Legal Action Project has been the nation's only law group taking on the corporate gun lobby and fighting in the courts to prevent gun deaths and injuries. We reform the negligent and dangerous practices in the gun industry by representing victims of gun violence in high impact lawsuits, including law enforcement officers shot in the line of duty, as well as children and families. We have one remarkable precedent holding that the gun companies can be leashed can be held legally responsible for the damage caused by their irresponsible business practices. Our victories have forced gun dealers and manufacturers to reform their practices to prevent sales of guns to dangerous people and has sent a message to the bad apple gun dealers that supply over half the guns traced to crime that they cannot get away with profiting from arming criminals and gun traffickers. <coughs> the Legal Action Project also works with public officials to defend gun laws that are under attack and challenges laws and regulation that worsen the problem of gun violence. We have filed briefs and provided legal advice on hundreds of gun law cases and won precedent-setting victories in the high level of federal courts, including the Supreme Court. Now, a little bit of my own personal deals on why we need to have some form of gun control. First of all, I don't trust half the people who I know have guns in the home or, or weapons. And it's not that uh, I'm not an advocate of, of, of the responsible use of firearms. I do think that background checks, licensing, and other things have their place when owning a gun. Let me put it to you this way. In order for me to drive, I have to go to the state of Illinois certify that I have a driver's license, it's registered with the state, and I'm held responsible for my driving actions. I would think that, you know, you, you have to go to the state to get a FOID card, but I would think that would be at least the minimum, the bare minimum what we should do. And perhaps maybe we should take on the laws of Australia to maybe help combat this uh, crime of gun violence. Since our speaker, again for a second time, did not show up, uh, we're going to now turn it over to anybody else tonight who would like to speak specifically to this issue. I'd like to have somebody get up. Come on up, Raj. We'll give each of you, we're going to suspend the questions and answers tonight. We'll give each of you maybe about eight to nine minutes, and maybe towards the end we'll take some questions and answers. So please, keep it uh, simple. We'll keep the time somewhat loose with the rebuttal period. So let's hear some responsible uh, speeches and short diatribes on whether we should have before or against gun, gun violence. Uh, we're going to try to get, uh, let the bus boys uh, get this area cleaned up and we should get out of here by quarter to nine. Yeah. So that's that's the arrangement we have with the restaurant and I know they say they close at nine o'clock but they want this area closed and cleaned up at quarter to nine so if we can start uh, heading toward the back by like 25 to nine uh, right. and, and chat out there it'll be great. Okay. Right. Thank you. No. Okay, now go ahead. Raj will give you about seven minutes okay. per speaker. Please be articulate. Please have something ready. Not just get on a bunch of diatribes. We're trying to make up for the loss of um, the, the loss of a speaker tonight. So please, let's get ready and do a good rebuttal. Hope he wasn't shot. 
I don't know, but uh, last time he had was in the emergency room of the hospital. And now that's where we rescheduled them. We don't know what happened today. Okay, Raj, go ahead. Raj Patel, for, for starters, I don't think uh, our uh, gun law or gun crimes are that big except in selective locations. By and large, we are a safe country. Okay. There are locations and there are cities, there, and within city there are localities where there is a problem. So let, let us not exaggerate this much. Because we have a problem somewhere, do not globalize it. When you globalize the problem, we don't solve the problem and we create more problems. And th this is what happened. We globalize the issue and it's not there. Then, then most neighborhoods in Chicago, they are safe. I mean, you can see it in the statistics. And uh, some neighborhoods are a very serious problem. So let's go and solve where there is a problem. And I agree that. If you solve a problem, uh, there's uh, some precinct and some, what do you call it, some area. But there are serious problems. And let's go and clean that thing up. And we are not doing it. OK? So, second thing, the, the 40, I mean, in a white community, if you take out the, that the mass shooters, which are told you multiple, multiple, multiple people, the, by and large, it's safe. The most of the problem arises right, from a, it's a problem within, within a family or within a friend, and they, they shoot somebody. And uh, this is not going to, they, if they one way or the other way, they can run a car over them, something going to happen. So this kind of issue in a community, to some extent, you have to expect and it's going to happen. Okay, you cannot you cannot go and create a law and, and say, well, you know, let's solve it because in a second test, you know, we had a one, one murder first time and we've been there for 30 years. It doesn't go, I don't think it's working like that. All, all these laws, let, let me explain this way, that uh, how many laws, if this, all these laws are supposed to work, why did not to your satisfaction clean up? It has to be cleaned up, I mean, with all this law. Chicago has so many laws, it should have solved. Why New York City, why New York City solved its problem and Chicago did not? Why, 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 why New Orleans did not? Why uh, Baltimore did not? Okay, and, and we did not. Okay, so I mean, that, that is a problem. Look at scientifically. Where, what is the problem? Define it very narrowly and then find a solution to solve that particular problem. Don't globalize that we have problem everywhere. It's not. Okay? This, this, is, this is the biggest problem on issue after issue after issue that we globalize when there is no necessity to globalize the issue. You solve the, you find out a problem, you, you diagnose it, you analyze it, you come up with a strategy, what do you, what, how, how can we solve, or can it be solved at all? Now, I, I live in Utah, in a Rocky Mountain, okay? I don't think they'll give up their gun for anything. Most of them, most of them are hunters. And it's so, so some of them live in a further area from the city or the, where police are. If they have to call the cops, you know, you go to Virginia, another country. You have to, you have to call the cops, or it will take half an hour for them to come. People do not want to live in a, in an outer borough where, in an area where they have farms and, and uh, somebody comes and tries to shoot you, you don't have no, you know, we are, what is happening in a city is that, and what is happening with lots of people here, is that, that we, we think that whole Ameri all America is Chicago, and it's not. All America is a, everything in the city is not. Okay, and it's still, in the inner city we have a more problem, and even the suburbs, I tell, I tell you, in, in a comparison to what problems we have, I rather, I rather spend, a, if I have a 500 million dollars to, to gun control and 500 million dollars to put hungry people, feed hungry people in the city of Chicago, I rather feed hungry people because you, do you know how many hungry people are there? You go, you know, you go in a neighborhood you do not know. I can, I can see it. There are hungry people here. And I go on 151 bus, 
on a Monday, I can see them. I got a 22 bus, you know, I can see them. I got 36 bus, I can see it from one end to other end. Okay, and that is not a gun problem. That is a hunger problem in America. And you do you know something? Why we do not have a, a, as many soup kitchens? So this people can be paid. And we are talking about gun problem. Okay. Now, how many, uh, how many, I mean, I've, I've been accosted with a knife three times in my life. All in New York City. New York City. I was just sort of one here in Chicago, guy grabbed me from back. Okay. But there was no gun. Okay. But I mean, I can understand that some people have, some people have fancy about it. It's fine. Okay. But look, do sensibly. I don't solve a problem. You know, I, I tell you, you can go to talk, talk to murderers. And I, t I tell you a very simple thing. If somebody criminally shoots somebody else, okay, and you, you, you just decide very quickly, and get a defense, get a defense, make a simple law, whether he committed a crime deliberately or not. If he committed a crime deliberately, just kill him and end up the story. And I don't think we'll, we'll have less crime then. If guy shoots somebody criminally, okay, then just, hey, quick justice, out, go. Thank you. All right, All right. next. Right. Oh, yeah. Yes. Hello, Zunikhan. Can you say any years? What's I that? didn't know the gun. Why did it ever occur to me that someone was going to break in my house? Yeah, but and I'm then I've never heard of this happening. So what do you mean? What everybody, everybody in the country needs a gun? No, not everybody needs. I never, I never, but, but, I never locked my house. No, but everybody don't need. But some people in Utah need. Somebody in West Virginia need. I was way up in the. All right. May I remind everybody that uh, we do have other rebutters coming up, so let's get on to the next rebutter. Go ahead. Yes, on the uh, to buy a gun in this state is uh, very hard. We just don't hand out guns. You have to get an FOP card, and after that, when you go to purchase a gun, you have background checks you have to go to, which even applies to if you're going to a gun show. The only thing that's allowed is uh, private sales from, from one individual to another. So keep calm and carry one. Yeah. I got a question. All right, next speaker. Rush, wait a minute. Rush. Start with I'm sorry. Stay up there, Rush. There were all kinds of gun dealers they discovered, and they don't. And when they looked at, they don't have gun shops. They operate out of their houses. Hello. I know. I bought one from one. My name is Andy Anderson. Uh, a lot of you know me. A lot of them are at the gun shop. Okay. Let's let Hello. Andy talk. Hey, Charlie. Charlie, we're trying to keep give our next rebutter, please. Well, he started before we finished answering. Sorry about that. I'd like to mention a couple of things that uh, are not normally in the news discussed when we're talking about gun violence and mass shootings and why we seem to have more of these in our country than some other countries where uh, the public has as many guns per thousand people or more, but they don't have the mass shootings that we do. Well, We have, in this country, a for-profit medical industrial complex. We have a for-profit medical system that pushes drugs on people, uh, starting with little kids in school, they're diagnosed as ADD or AD, whatever those things are, hyper kids, uh, they're getting medicated at an early age. And one of the things that's never talked about is these antidepressant drugs. Uh, Jim Mars, the investigative reporter, and several others have, have been done studies on this. If you look at uh, the, these so-called so mass shootings where there was Columbine or uh, a bunch of others, almost invariably these young people are on one of these antidepressants that has uh, in the little fine print, they tell you, oh, by the way, uh, in, in, in rare cases, one of the effects of this drug is it is pushes people towards suicide or homicide. 
and uh, if you correlate the number of um, mass shootings uh, that have gone up in this country in the last 20 years, 30, 40 years, with uh, the increase of these highly, highly profitable pharmaceuticals, where you know they'll make a bottle of pills for $10 and sell it for 5000 these things are very, very profitable in America because we have a for-profit medical industrial complex. That's one of the things. Another thing is uh, a lot of young people, especially people of minorities in inner city, when they get out of, if they graduate from high school, they're looking at two forms, about the only two forms of making a living that's available to them is dealing drugs or going into the military. Because uh, you have 500 people graduate from high school, those factories where they used to go to work uh, and do all kinds of work, uh, apprenticeships or whatever, the companies that used to manufacture things where people could get out of high school and go to work, those factories, the, the buildings, are not in America anymore. They're in other countries. The American companies are still manufacturing a lot of stuff, except. Uh, 40 years, 50 years ago, when we got out of high school, you could go down the street in Chicago and, and knock on doors uh, with companies and say, hey, I'm an able-bodied person, I'd like to go to work. And you could get a job and support yourself at minimum wage. There's another one that is never, ever talked about, is that in America, the minimum wage has not kept up with inflation or anything else. <clears throat> in uh, Bernie Sanders tells a story of, uh, I think it was Bernie, when he was young, uh, his mother got a job and um, supported the family on a minimum wage job. You can't do that today. If, you know, the minimum wage compared to 1962, if it had kept, uh, kept up with the cost of living and everything else, the minimum wage would be about $22.50, close to $23 an hour, compared to having the cost of everything else. So this fight for $15 uh, is still way below what you need to live on with what we have in America. And so young people coming out of, uh, especially young mi minorities coming out of high school, if they graduate, they have basically the choice is uh, start join a gang and start uh, dealing drugs to make money or go into the military and uh, go over to Iraq and Afghanistan get an arm or a leg blown off come back and uh, be on uh, painkillers for the rest of your life uh, these you don't just look at the number of guns and say well the number of guns is a problem let's cut down the number of guns it's the overall society's conditions that lead people, you know, to using guns in, uh, in the first place. Okay? Are you going to talk? Or? No. Okay. Uh, so, I would, uh, you know, Censored News, Project Censored out of Sonoma State that I talk about every year, uh, on the top 25 blacked out stories. They've had uh, the top 25 one story per year has dealt with these kinds of things, the condition of uh, hopeless conditions in inner cities in America where uh, young people basically have, if they don't join the military, they have no hope of getting a living wage job. And anyway, uh, many people have no hope of getting a minimum wage job. 300 people graduate from high school, well, there, there's 10 jobs available in the community. What are the other 290 going to do now that they're out of school? They're on the street. They have no, no hope of getting any kind of income and doing anything legal for any company because those companies have moved the buildings. There are 60,000, 70,000 factories were moved. Big companies moved those buildings out of America and into other countries. And this is, this is one of the outrageous things that's never talked about because it's a quiet. game changer. People no, you can't be quiet no matter. We have... Uh, Okay, if any, anybody have any questions out there, uh, want to reference or anything before I uh, give up the mic to the next person? Uh, you've got about a minute left, but let's get okay. to the next well, speaker. Well, the next person can come up. That, that pretty much ends my thought. I, I would, the last thing I would stress to people, um, 
the best news site is way better than anything else on radio and television. If you want to know what's going on, log on daily to a daily breaking news site. It's called commondreams.org, news for the progressive community. And it's, uh, they post the best of the best breaking news stories all day long, every day. Yeah, back there, you had a question? When's Trump going to do stop us first? I'd like to stop us first. Well, uh, oh, come on. The question is, when is Trump going to do stop and frisk? He didn't talk about that at all. What? He didn't hear. talk about that. I can't hear. Why don't you hear the time? I don't want to talk about it. One well, of the, if, if, you, if, if he didn't talk about it in the talk, why are you asking about something he didn't talk about? Something I wanted to know. It was, hey, Charlie, it was a question about gun know. control and the gun violence and everything else. He didn't else. talk about stop and frisk. I want to talk about stock. Well, get up there and rebut, Bubba. Then get up there and talk about it. What am I going to get for Christmas? What? Okay, that, that looks like. Uh, All right, may I remind us to keep civil? We're going to go to rebuttal soon if everybody. No, not that we're, we're, we're officially there now. Andy, we have we have to. We were, we're, we're ready time, to move toward. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, anybody else want to come up and say let's, a few words? Yeah. Next. All right. Next. Come on. Early out. weather. All right. All right. Let's come on. Even though I'm not. I'd like some good rebuttals tonight, so please. If we tried uh, to talk about all of the causes of death and injuries caused by guns, we'd be here until this time tomorrow. I'd like to focus tonight on perhaps the most common, when they are reported, uh, cases of gun injury or death, and that is accidental. <laughs> when I was a small kid, my father had a number of police friends come over to the house to play poker, to do whatever, and to get into arguments. Uh -oh. They were all intensely <laughs> political, <clears throat> and one of the things that was the rule of the house, when the officers came over, they would take off their gun belts, put it in a dresser drawer. Good. I was instructed as a little kid never ever to go into that dresser drawer. I was shown what was in there and it was pointed out that I had my cap guns in my room in a dresser drawer just like the big folks did. Now, I realized that these things were not toys. I realized that you took off your gun and you play poker or whatever, and sometimes arguments would develop. The reason there were no accidental homicides in our house was because there were no guns readily available. Um, this is a simple solution for a certain type of gun situation. I might point out that the sergeant who came over most frequently and was most careful about making sure that I or any of the other kids in sight did not get a hold of those guns, himself died of a gunshot wound when he came home one evening and his wife was just as inebriated as he was. He died. His wife tried to commit suicide several years later. Uh, I don't know whatever became of her. The point of the matter is, guns are not toys. The sooner we inculcate this reality into our children or our nephews or whatever, you're not going to have a total situation where you have no more gun injuries and no more deaths, but you are going to have, if you teach respect for these firearms, and the explanation and the understanding that these things are not to be played around with you have that much fewer. Um, you're still going to have the person who is going to go postal. Uh, you're still going to have the person who is going to uh, settle an argument or try to settle an argument in the back alley outside the saloon. This will happen. I'm not saying it's good. I am simply saying that we have to deal with each of these types of gun injuries as separate entities. I don't know why it is that here in the United States we have an incredible amount of gun injuries, whereas countries like Israel, for example, everybody in Israel practically, male or female, between the ages of uh, like 17 and uh, 55, has a gun at home. 
they're all members of the Israeli equivalent of the militia, and you don't hear about that many uh, gun injuries. In Switzerland, every male in Switzerland, uh, until recently, I think, uh, was required to keep in good order a firearm and a complete uniform and kit ready should he be called in the event that the country was invaded. I think we're aware of the fact that there has not been an invasion in Switzerland for several hundred years. We have to deal with these things intelligently, we have to take some of the grammar away from it, and we have to stop making excuses for, well, this is the American way. And then they're going to start blaming, you know, too many cowboy movies or whatever. The fact of the matter is, even the cowboys were fairly careful about their weapons, because their weapons were the tools of their trade. Uh, I don't have any solutions tonight. Uh, if I did, I'd probably get shot by the NRA uh, for suggesting it. But the truth of the matter is, we've got to look at these things as we would any other health hazard. Mind if I steal some? I'm not against guns. They have a place. I'm not against teaching kids. In fact, what I would like to do, and this would get me uh, castigated by some people, I think every American kid should go through, just as we have driver's ed, I think every American kid should be exposed to firearm safety. He's not required to own a gun, he's not required to ever use one again, just so that he or she, let's be equal about this, knows how to use a gun. Why? The number of people that get blown away by accidents, and I know of two people personally who were seriously injured by guns when they started fooling around, you know, twisting. Hey, I walked through the East Chicago Avenue police station once when I was doing a story, and here is a supervisor walking down the hall, twirling his gun like he was Wild Wild Earp, Wild Earp, or like he was a member of Wild Bill Cody's Wild West show. <laughs> Let's get real. The guns are with us. They're going to be with us. Now let's see if we can't find a way of putting this thing to intelligent controls. If you say, let's wipe away all guns, you're not going to get anywhere. If you say, teach every person who wants to have a gun the safe handling of guns, and the idea that guns kill. You know, it's an old slogan, but it's a real one. Stop playing around, these are not toys. Once we come to that, re once we come to that realization, we're going to have at least a few fewer gun injuries in this country. Then we can start dealing with some of the other causes, but don't come to me for those answers because I haven't got those answers at hand tonight. But safe handling of guns is a good way to start. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Well, Our next question. All right, who's the next well, rebutter? Yeah, what's your question? Isn't your plan is going to accelerate the, the amount of gun violence in the United States. You're going to teach everyone how to use weapons. Is that a question or a rebuttal? Is that a question or a rebuttal, Charlie? The use of weapons. They're likely to say, I need all I need to <sighs> since I already taught how to use it and taught how to shoot. No, because if they pay attention to the course, they'll realize that that's not the solution to their problem at the moment. I'm not using gun. I'm not using gun. I'm using it effectively to kill someone. That's a great idea. I fired a gun lots of times and I haven't killed anyone yet. You're going to double the statistics. All right. All right, Charlie. Charlie, Charlie let's go to our next rebutter. And please, you got seven minutes. Seven. Make it, okay. make it, make it uh, co cogent and coherent. Why? <laughs> All right, so. Because you're being recorded and I would think that if you're going to rebut, Let's go get on with it. Okay, which which one of you monkeys want to hear my Sean Spicer invitation? All right, I no, I <laughs> All right, okay, listen here. You know what we're going to talk about? We're going to talk about not only Trump doing frisking, stopping and frisking, we're going to talk about the NRA is a... Uh, marketing group to increase sales volume of guns. That's what they were set up to do. Yeah, true. Yeah. Okay, so 
the more that they tell people to own guns, protect themselves, they're all, if any kind of publicity is not, you know, it's good publicity, they want sales volumes of, for gun manufacturers to go sky high. Now, when I was a kid, nobody cared about guns. Nobody carried them around. Nobody made a big issue. Nobody was shooting up the damn place. But now, who is the moron that started this carry stuff? Then it's like, okay, oh, we all got to have guns. We all got to carry guns into public places. We got, you know, this is, uh, you know, the, the whole country's under siege. So the NRA, you know, has done a wonderful job of marketing fear, marketing guns, marketing death, marketing carry. <clears throat> telling people that, you know, uh, you got to have guns everywhere. And personally, I'm, I don't mind people having guns at all. In fact, I'd like to go hunting someday and shoot a deer or a rabbit. Well, you know, what the heck? Why? Because, you know. What did the rabbit ever do? Well, okay, maybe I won't hunt them. I'll go buy Why do you need to kill something? Okay, you know what? I'm, uh, then I won't shoot them. Okay, I'll go buy some deer or rabbit. <laughs> okay, so, but somebody shot it anyway, you know, so. Anyway, so, um, okay, so Trump said he was going to continue stopping and frisking. What the hell is wrong with that? Huh? Yes, he did. Because the New York City cops do it, and their murder rate went straight down. That was the one thing that stopped murders in New York. But we don't do it, because Rahm, the ballet dancer, will not allow it. Because it's the Supreme fringes. Court. But just to interject, the Supreme Court. Well, they're wrong. Are they always I, right? I agree with you, but the Are Supreme they Court of okay. the United States banned stop and frisk. That's why we don't do it. And it might sound a little right wing, but I'm all in for You know what? I don't carry a gun around. If I had a gun, it'd be locked up at all. I'd be paranoid about somebody breaking in and getting it. So, you know, I don't have a gun. I have baseball bats, and God willing, I can still run. By the way, if anybody ever pulls out a gun, just run like hell. Don't even ask questions, because they're psycho. I never, ever, ever trust anyone that has a gun, ever. Because there's no reason to have a gun in public. Really, there is none. These people want to be a hero and stop a, a mass shooting. You know what, if you see somebody pull out a gun, quietly leave as fast as you can. And everybody has a cell phone, there's three numbers, 911, and you say, get over here, cops, and arrest that son of a bitch. And shoot him first, maybe. Well, unless you're LeBron McDonald, and then at least the cops who are doing this. Well, there are bad <coughs> cops. You know, yeah, there's there probably sure are. hundreds of thousands there of cops sure in the are. United States. I would guess that 90% of them are pretty rational, but there are idiot ones, yeah. and they belong in jail. Yeah. And guess what? The Laquan McDonald cop? Yeah. What's his name? Whatever. Van Dyke. Van Dyke. Van Dyke. He is going to be in jail, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, so. Okay. So anyway, so I wanted to talk about stop and frisk. I'm waiting for Trump to start doing that, because I'm all in favor, because I don't want somebody coming into dampers with a gun. Or, you know, some idiot carrying a gun that go off by accident somewhere, kill, kill one of the college people. And um, NRA is a big marketing company that just promotes gun sales. And the last thing I wanted to say, how much time do we got? You got two minutes. You want me to keep going? Yes. The third thing I was going to talk about is, as it turns out, Part of my product line that I'm a consultant in is the complete opposite of guns. I am in the safety and security business, part of it, electronic systems. So, you know, there really isn't any reason to have a gun at home, <laughs> really. If you have an adequate burglar alarm system with panic but buttons and cameras, that should be a deterrent enough at your premise to keep any person away. And so I don't want to pump my uh, you know, product lights. I represent Honeywell and ADT. Ooh. But anyway, so um, there really is no reason to have a gun. 
Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. So, just a couple minutes ago, I heard, I don't want to camera. Um, well, say, go ahead. Save until my is two minutes are over. Yeah, very good. Couple of days ago, I just want to give your opinion. A couple of days ago, with the news, the WLS news, yeah. they will say briefly. One guy was sitting. In, one guy was in his house watching TV. Yeah. And he was on the couch. I don't know if there was, there was locked or not locked. I have no idea. But speak louder. I get angry with your wife. I don't know if door was locked or not locked. Right. So he was watching TV and he tried to take a nap, a little nap. Yeah. Somebody wake him up. This somebody guy like burglar. During the middle of the day? Yes. Well break ins he have so residential break ins. He even didn't oh, have a chance to call uh, the police and pick up his But you're wrong. So no You're wait, just wrong and you wait, let call me, 911. Let me tell you very quick. So it was like matter of the second. No, I I am I'm absolutely agree what you said. I'm very agree. But he didn't have chance. and he like scared him and he just put his hand to the packet and this uh, somehow I excuse my language. Uh, covered. He was okay. here, and he thought maybe this guy pick up knife or uh, try to protect himself. Okay. And he was like run away. So he was lucky he was not hurt. That's what I said. You got to leave the seat. You got to leave. So, so, oh, he acted like he had a gun? Yeah, okay. but he don't. Oh, he well, don't. He don't have All right. So, so, well, I'm not going to do that. So Let's, my, I'm my, just going to run. My question <laughs> to you. So what, do you, what do you think? Should this guy have uh, some protection weapon if somebody burglars? If somebody house, walks then? into my house in the middle of the day, I'm leaving. Okay. And I'll call 911. Let's, do I get credit uh, for well, like, this if, happened. <laughs> well, you elected to have the question. Your seven minutes is up. Let's move on to I the I was going to talk about there's really no reason to carry, to have a gun, in theory. I mean, why? You're gonna, there's going to be accidents. There's going to be the suicide things if somebody gets wrong. There, burglaries, one of the favorite things to burglarize in a house, besides jewelry, is firearms. I've been to murder scenes where people had a murder or an assault or an order of protection, and I have to do the electronic security afterwards, after the fact. Okay. But right, there really is no reason to have guns. Okay. Well, I would, she took like two, three minutes of my time. Well, you acknowledge you her do 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 See? <laughs> I had a oh, number, number four point. Come back for a rebuttal. Come back, there might yeah, be a I get a rebuttal? Yeah. <laughs> let's, uh, right. let's move I'll, on I'll to the next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> I could spend my entire my time here just rebutting Mike, but I won't Seven do minutes, uh, let's go. I want to, uh, I loved, Tim, I loved your statistics, except you, you know, you went awful fast. It'd be nice if you They're all would in the like Brady put together website. a couple of websites. Yeah, when you, when you, when you come up, give us the website. Uh, and one of the statistics I think you touched on is that two thirds of gun deaths are suicides. They're not. Uh, they're not murders. And a lot of people just don't realize that. That doesn't make it any uh, less, you know, horrible than when somebody dies. But it's they. They. They are suicides. Uh, and Raj, I agree with Raj. Uh, we think of all, we hear about all this violence and we hear uh, the image that Chicago has and Donald Trump says we're a terribly violent city. Uh, in point of fact, yes, we had 762 murders last year. And uh, that was up from the year before, but it was down in the 80s and 90s. Many years we had eight and 900 murders. Uh, the, we're a much less violent city today than we were then. We seem to be going up uh, in part because of the fact that the big gangs were decapitated as a matter of strategy by the city of Chicago, uh, Jeff Fort and all these other big guys, I don't remember their names, were put in jail. So they, get, they thought, okay, now the monster will die. The monster did die. It split into uh, like 600 gangs we have now in Chicago as opposed to a smaller number of much bigger ones. Dancer Disciples were 120,000 members uh, back in the 80s and 90s, and now they don't exist anymore. We've got 600 gangs which means lots of boundaries between all the gangs. When there are boundaries, there is conflict at those boundaries. So this is one of the reasons we're having a lot of violence. Uh, the fact of the matter is 75% uh, of the violence comes from 15 neighborhoods, 14 of which are African American, one of which is Hispanic. So the uh, violence is very focused. It's, most of it is gang related. and. Uh, uh, also, a lot of the violence is committed with guns. Uh, another statistic from a couple years ago from a, from a police official, I believe at county level, 
four gun stores provide the guns that are in, in, a, in a large portion of the crimes committed in Chicago, the gun crimes. One in Indiana and three in Chicago. And nonetheless, we don't seem to be able to, uh, to stop it. Uh, also, just for, uh, for perspective, uh, we are, as far as violence goes, we are number 18 in, in the United States per capita Not as far as gun violence. Okay, so this business, Chicago is the big bad gun, uh, gun violence city, is not actually true. It's partially imaged. And some years ago, this statistic may have changed. Only one American city was in the top 20 of violence, uh, violent cities in the world. Uh, most of them were in the Middle East and in Latin America. The one city was Detroit, I believe, and I believe they were number 18. Okay, so so the, we have an image of violence that goes beyond what we deserve. That doesn't mean it's a good thing and that we shouldn't be concerned about it. Uh, we definitely should. Uh, I got a lot of the statistics. I attended two lectures. Uh, the University of Chicago had a bunch of lectures for their alumni weekend. One today by Arnie Duncan. That's where some of the numbers came from that I just uh, gave you. And then they had another group of, of people that are working on programs, oh. as is Arnie Duncan. They're pro what they're doing is they're trying to give jobs. We understand, we seem to have a general agreement and understanding that economics plays a lot to do with the problems that, uh, that we have that cause the gun violence. People are desperate. They need to make a basic living. We think they're always drug dealers are making a lot of money. The average drug dealer on the south side is making like $30 a day or something like that. Okay. And one of them said to one of the one of the people that interviewed him is the, the reason he does it is he doesn't want his mother to have to be a hoe. Okay. Otherwise, uh, she lies on her back or he goes out to sell drugs. That's how the family is supported. And and that uh, uh, unfortunately is the reality of life for many 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 people. And uh, who was it? Was it Andy that uh, talked about the, the manufacturing jobs going away? So it isn't. It's largely economic. What these people are trying to do. And, including Arnie Duncan's group, is to get people into jobs. And what they did is they interviewed lots and lots of people that were perceived as being potentially violent, living in a violent community, or have, or have a record of violence. And they said, what would it take you to get you to give this up and, 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 to, and to try and lead a straight life? And they said, 11 to $13 an hour. That's all they want. For, for a lot of these people. And that's what they're trying to do, is, is put together jobs between 11 and $13 an hour to get these people out of this, uh, out of this uh, lifestyle that they're in. Uh, my prescription for the, well, Bad Apple, the topic tonight was Bad Apple gun stores. Yes, uh, we need to close these guys down. Uh, how do we do it? Uh, gun tracking, the way we track autos, uh, from the original manufacturer uh, until the gun is potentially destroyed at some point. You have to, when you sell your car, even as an individual, you have to transfer the title. The title has to go into the state. We could could do the same things with guns and have high penalties for people that don't bother to do it. Uh, large fines, even even short imprisonment. Uh, one of the statistics that I've heard, I don't know if it's true, is that a large percentage of crimes is committed with stolen guns. Well, the question is, were these guns really stolen, or was it a straw purchase, or, or what was it? We want to get rid of the straw purchasers. If we had high fines and even short imprisonment terms for people who did not follow the transferring of the guns policies, uh, we might reduce some of the uh, some of the ease of getting guns. Anybody who wants a gun can get a gun. That is that in today's world, that is not a problem. But if we if we had at least tracked who had the gun last, they would be at least partially responsible for any crime. And I would go ahead and maybe uh, maybe uh, find the gun manufacturer. Okay, the gun manufacturer's name should be clearly on the guns in a way that can be altered. Any crime committed with a, with a Smith and Wesson, they get fined five thousand dollars. A murder, they get fined ten or twenty thousand dollars. They would start to be very very concerned about who their dealers were and what type, type of tracking their dealers were doing of these guns. Um, okay. Concealed carry could say a bunch about concealed carry. Stop and frisk. We know stop and frisk reduces crime. Yeah. Uh, yet the Supreme Court has decided that it is that, that we can't do stop and frisk. 
The New York murder rate went down, yep. but uh, I guess the, the dignity is more important than saving lives. So that's that's what we got. Okay, uh, time's up. And Mike, Mike, I am going to report you to PETA for saying that you're going to shoot a rat. <laughs> well, <laughs> next. Next. <laughs> next. Please be clear and concise. For the record, uh, I took German in high school, and I think Gruber means late, <laughs> so much so that you should not be rescheduled for a future event. That's what Gruber's translation roughly means in English. So, sorry, Gruber, had to say it. Uh, inevitably, a lot of these topics uh, every Saturday night lead me to one conclusion, we need more planets. Uh, we need a planet where there's no guns at all, where the families can be, where people who like to garden and play music and learn lots of languages and meet new people and go to freedom of speech forums can go to, and then people who really like to hunt and or just like the right to fire bullets into the air can go to that planet. But unfortunately, we only have one planet. And on that planet, uh, your government has used guns in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Palestine, Syria, Mexico, Colombia. The list is long. So this debate is framed in a way that governments love to debate the issue one-dimensionally. They love to say it's always working class people who misuse guns. If you were to ask an extraterrestrial civilization who on earth is most responsible for the misuse and or abuse of guns, they would unanimously say the United States of America government. Sorry, that's just the truth, and that doesn't mean they would say the United States of America people, but they would say the government. There's too many funerals thanks to the wisdom of Washington, D.C. So I know I'd like to frame this in a way of making it domestically more safe for working class people in the country, but, you know, it's always gov government officials and government uh, payroll people who love to say we should just get rid of all the guns. Well, what they mean is let's get rid of all the guns for the people who do the proportionally least amount of killing. And I know that's kind of like the river calling the lake wet, but that's the type of situation we have in this topic whenever we get into it. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. I, I wish we could go back to the days of uh, John Brown and Tom Paine and Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson, where it took a real long time to load that gun, so you better be really sure that the person you're shooting at is an actual enemy of you and your community. You know, you'd have to read, you'd have to read one of the transcripts of a rebuttal at the College of Complex. Uh, guns are not toys. True. I agree with you, guns are not toys. So you should be very, 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 very uh, versed in a long educational process that is many, many stages, whether you are allowed to ever own a gun in a true democracy. And I'm sure they have in some of my favorite countries, like the Scandinavian countries, I'm sure they have those programs in place where, yeah, you can own a gun. But like we've said, most people just do it for not even target practice at animals, just target practice at a target on a range. It's not that big of a deal in Scandinavia. People don't have to have guns because they're not afraid. They're not insecure. They're not subject to 24-7 divide and conquer. They actually get along and coexist with each other. It's an amazing concept, believe it or not. Um, Noam Chomsky once said, if the Nuremberg laws were strictly enforced, every U.S. president post-World War II would be hanged. <laughs> now, I think about that in regards to this uh, issue. Let me just go down the list of the average money spent each year on military. In the United States, it's $600 billion. China, $200 billion. Russia, $75 billion. Saudi Arabia, somebody that our prevaricator-in-chief just went to visit and give him a big handshake and a lot of arms, new arms deal. What a proud moment for all of us back here at home <laughs> to see that on the TV. $75 billion on average for that wonderful example of peace and diplomacy. France, $58 billion. UK, $55 billion. Germany, $45 billion. Japan, India, South Korea, Italy, anywhere between 30 and 45 billion. Um, the people who have been warning us that guns are out of control and violence is out of control, uh, who I think most tonight are people like Julian Assange. He has to hide out 
in an embassy for several years because he's warning how this gun issue is out of control on a global scale, not just domestically. That's the things you get for sticking up for everyday people's rights to live in a peaceful community if you're a journalist from the United States government that then yeah, loves sure, to get sure. on the press conference and say how ah, they're so for diplomacy and peace. Yeah, right. Julian Assange uh, gets him in a checkmate on that bullshit statement. Edward Snowden, another guy who had to leave his own country and is on hi in hiding now thanks to the fact that he committed that horrible, horrible violation of telling the American people that innocent you know, villagers and extreme poverty communities were being drone strike murdered by our government with our tax dollars. So that's the hypocrisy of the United States that government. That was Bradley Manning. In the group of journalists, Edward Snowden had a large part to do with that, revealing what's going on with the drone strikes. I could go into it afterwards further on that. There's a whole book about it that I let Andy borrow, but Anyway, the main thing I'd like to say tonight is a website I've been watching the last couple of months by George Webb and Jason Goodman. These are the guys who are breaking the murder, which was a gun murder, of Seth Rich, a guy who worked for the DNC last summer and mysteriously was murdered late at night in Washington, D.C. neighborhood. Where you'd think there'd be the highest level of surveillance in the world, especially post-Patriot Act. Now, Ask yourself that. We have the Patriot Act, so we have unlimited surveillance. So shouldn't we know everywhere where the drugs are coming into our country, the guns, the slavery, the crimes? Apparently not. Apparently we have so much surveillance that we never know where these things are coming from or going, oddly enough. Uh, so I encourage everybody to go to Crowdsource the Truth. It talks about how they're trying to get to the bottom of uh, the empire's hypocrisy and crimes, and uh, we might have another situation just like we had in the early 70s where much like now we had somebody who was really qualified to be president like George McGovern but he didn't become uh, president much like Bernie and also we had a president who finally in a brief moment of democracy had to get the hell out because we the people had enough and Richard Nixon thank you very much all right yeah. next all right, all right. Um, all, right. Uh, uh, all right Ernie uh, Ernie said that uh, stop and frisk reduced crime and he cited the statistics in New York where they implemented the stop and frisk program and subsequently the crime rate went down as if one had caused the other. There's a logical fallacy called, um, called the, it's that the post hoc fallacy, it, it comes from Latin post hoc, ergo propter hoc, it's after this, therefore because of this. Just because one thing follows another, let's say I sneeze and Mount St. Helens erupts, that doesn't mean that, that one caused the other. Uh, the author of Freakonomics has argued that um, that it was the that, that Roe versus Wade in the 1970s actually caused the drop in the crime rate in the 1990s. Uh, so there are, other, there are other explanations. Now, to move on, one fool at a time, Ernie. Is, so I'm the fool on, on stage now. But you said um, okay, now, now, okay, now I'm going to talk over. I'm going to talk over you, Ernie. So, uh, but I knew I was knew I was going to get a rise out of you over this. So now I want to just tell you a story. Okay, I'm going to talk over you too, Tim. So I'm going to. So now I want to tell you guys a story about guns and me. Uh, I've gone back and forth on this whole gun thing, you know, and. Um, I don't really know, you know, I don't really know what to think, but um, back before I started, before I came here to Chicago uh, in the late 90s and I started attending the college complexes, I used to hang out with a group of guys, like what Pat was telling about, guys that used to, guys, guys that owned guns, that, that used to get together and play games on Friday or Saturday night. Uh, now we didn't play poker. We played uh, we played board games and war games like Squad Leader and stuff like that, which were board games. Use little little tokens. Uh, we didn't play for money. Uh, these guys, however, brought their gun. If they if they were carrying, they brought their guns in with them. And at, at, at first, and I was always pro-choice on the gun issue, but. Uh, at first, I found this a little unnerving, but I kind of got. Even though I was a gun owner myself, I own two handguns, but I found this a little bit unnerving. Still, I got used to it. One guy, you know, just on a lark, says, "Hey, can I, hey man, can I see your gun?" And he pulls his gun out, and says, "Everybody, ah! wait, ducks like like that scene in Goodfellas, you know." Uh, we didn't have any shootings, not while I was attending. Um, one of the guys, guys that he hosted the party, he he had a real thing about black people. Uh, he didn't like them. He also had a very expansive concept of, of, of what justifiable homicide is, self-defense. Um, and um, he, 
he he tried to he he and he and and sometimes if he was with his buddies he liked to provoke situations where he would have an excuse to kill a black okay and 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 he used to fantasize about murdering people uh, and he would argue vociferously about the right to keep and bear arms but he obviously would want to do a little bit more than just bear his arm uh, I, I went to a party with my parents I was pretty young then. I went to a, I went to a party with my parents of uh, University of Iowa alumni in, in Memphis where where I lived and um, actually was in the suburb of Memphis Germantown and now most most Memphis is about two thirds black, by the way. But most of the most of the white people in Memphis are pretty conservative. Their attitude is similar to that of white people in South Africa in the apartheid era. And uh, anyway, so I was at this party, and these are well-to-do people, like upper middle class kind of people. And somehow we got on the topic of guns because there had been some school shooting. And I started arguing how the you know the the the, 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 the pro-gun, the anti-gun people are going to use that use the latest school shooting as an excuse. To, to, to ban handguns and how they shouldn't do that and the Constitution, blah, 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 blah. And people looked at me like I was some kind of homicidal maniac and I suddenly felt, oh my God, you know, am, am I crazy? Everybody else is looking at me like, and these are Republicans. And I think, am I the crazy one? Um, I started to think about that and then something else happened. We had a falling, my friends had a bit of a falling out. There were two different guys that hosted the parties and they got into an argument with each other and things got real bad uh, over because one guy had to stay, be away and with his wife and his kids, and he tried to ca carry on the game by cell phone, and having another guy play and moving the pieces around on the board for him, and then he lost, or his side lost the game, and so he accused the other guys of cheating to make him lose, and uh, and things got real scary. And when I came over the next Friday to, to somebody's house, it wasn't at Dave at Dave Box house anymore. Uh, shit, I just blew, I shouldn't have said any names. Anyway, it wasn't at this guy's house anymore. It was at another guy's house. And and uh, and when I got there, Bob, the guy who was accused of cheating, was was sitting sitting in the table against the wall facing facing the front door, so he could he had a clear line of sight to. To, 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 to the front of the house. And he kept, while we played, he kept a loaded gun on the table, uh, point, uh, uh, not in his hand, but just sitting on the table, uh, with the barrel pointed towards, uh, towards the front door. Uh, since I was the last person, since I was the last person to show up at the party, uh, I had to take the I had to take the last empty seat, which was the one opposite the gun. <laughs> and it was then I started to have. I mean, they had nothing against me personally, so I wasn't too worried about it. But I started to get this hairy. Why did he have the gun? The reason he had it out this time instead of keeping it, yeah. it instead of having it stuck in his pocket, was because he was afraid that the other guy, the guy accusing them of cheating him, would show up uninvited. And then I started to think, this is getting a little out of hand. This yeah. is getting a little crazy. I kind of distanced myself from those guys, and eventually I just left Tennessee altogether, and I came up here. And, uh, and, and that kind of helped me put some distance. Because I, you know, I realized later, one, one of these guys used to brag about going shooting dogs and stuff, you know? So this, this, this is a rough crowd. So that's, I don't know what the point of my story is, except that's, that's my story about me and guns. <laughs> okay. All right. If you've got a chance, go ahead. You've got seven minutes. I doubt I'll need seven minutes. First of all, uh, Darren's story put me in mind of all the various Untouchables episodes in which uh, you see the gathering of people at somebody's house and they've all got Tommy guns. Um, has society really changed that much since the 1930s? Uh, that's number one. Number two, I would say I noticed on the internet, as I have told several other people, that you don't think that in virtually any state other than California and Maryland, you need a permit for these things, that any idiot can go out there and get a flamethrower. <laughs> Why is it, now I understand that they're needed to some extent for agricultural purposes, 
as I told several people, like in Florida, where that's how you harvest the sugar cane. They, they use flamethrowers to torch the field so they can burn off the leaves and the stuff they can't harvest. And it also has the beneficial effect from their point of view of killing any poisonous snakes that may be in the field. And then they can go ahead and harvest the sugar cane and ship that off to the sugar mill. Um, I think we've had a, a few too many incidents of, of bloody shootings in this country and around the world. I understand we had a speaker not long ago who tried to demonstrate that Sandy Hook was some kind of inside job. And I think that's a lot of baloney. It's one more reason why we needed gun control. And I heard somebody say earlier, all due respect to Patrick, that, well, if we teach people how to use gun safety and so on, that maybe we can cut down some of this. And maybe Patrick's right. On the other hand, we once had a man in this country named Oswald, and he knew full well how to use a gun he learned in the United States Marines. Okay. Uh, he's right, I just checked on the web. Go to a website called www.throwflame.com. They guarantee ownership next day, and that uh, they're federally unregulated. What's the range? 50 feet. 50 feet, you can get them online. What's the website again? Throwflame.com. dot com. Right. You, want you can order a flamethrower online. I want the United Airlines. Yes, Charlie. In North Korea, there's various forms of capital punishment for crimes, one of which is flamethrower. <laughs> that just brings me to a good rebuttal to kind of close with tonight. And I think in a large sense our gun ownership and our preoccupation with gun crime has a, real, has a real source. And I think it's because most Americans are starting to drift apart into their own little groups and don't trust each other anymore. You know, it's sort of like America has been in a slow decline over the last few years. We kind of haven't really noticed it for a while, except perhaps maybe it takes a lot longer to get something repaired. The potholes may be one or two more on the street. And it's been said we've kind of been in a, decli in a decline for a while. And I think it may be of the fact that we're not engaged as we once were as a population. We're not as open to new ideas as we once were. We're not open to listening to that other side anymore. And we're not open to a lot of things. It's sort of like we became a rich country and we all got maybe a little bit too comfortable and a little bit too spoiled. You know, Trump, in his famous thing, let's make America great again, kind of to me is perceived as we're the rich guys, we're going to blame others for our problems and try to get even. That to me is not the way to make America great again. To me, the real fundamental way to make America great again is to look at yourself. Look at what you're doing to make America great again. Are you one of these guys who sits there behind the, the screen and sit there and criticize everything? Or are you one of those guys who kind of actively participates in life? Kind of one of those guys that might help a guy on the side of the road. One of those guys who's actively active politically. Whether you be for gun control or against gun control, the point of the matter is that you get active and not just active politically. Go out and vote. Write your congressman. Join an organization that you think about or like. I myself am involved in a group called Toastmasters International, which is, helps a lot of people in the fine art of public speaking. 
I keep coming to the college of complexes every week and have dedicated most of my Saturday nights to this organization. Well, number one, it's fun. Number two, I make some good friends. And number three, I like the argument and the dialogue that goes along here. But at the end of the night, we all shake hands and we're all friends and we leave here with our differences there, but we're friends. You're here. The thing is, I think most Americans are of this mindset. Yes, we've seen a hollowing out of the middle class. Yes, we've seen things, but I think America can be really great again. We just have to work at it. Not just in a government sense, but in a personal sense. And I think if you really are going to make America great again, you're going to get involved civically. You're going to get involved in some type of cause. You're going to try to find a way out of that dead end job and get a better job. You're going to try to get more engaged in something. If you have kids, you're going to help them raise them a little better. If you're a shop owner, you're going to be fair and honest in your dealings with others. If you don't like the property taxes, you're going to get up in front of the government and protest them, but be reasonable. In short, what you need to do is a lot of our own country's problems are our own stinking fault. We really need to, we have a freedom. We have the power of the ballot box. We have a lot of different ways we can still exercise democratic authority, but yet we're not using it. Yes, we have Trump, yes, we have things, but this last election, we were trying to make a choice between the lesser of two evils and not for someone. Yes, there were a few minor party candidates that were running that I voted for one, which I was for. But again, maybe it's our own fault that we're here. Maybe we're not being as friendly as we can be. Maybe we're not as engaged civically as we can be. Maybe we're not involved as we should be. If there's anything I want to come out of tonight's lesson, that is get engaged. Get in a passion or a hobby that you like and join an association or an organization. If you're politically inclined, get involved and do something about it. If you don't, if you want to see the gun control laws changed, get active. Get in with the Brady campaign. There, my friends. I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> We got a little time, Charlie. Oh, I just tell you some quick stories here. Uh, my good friend here, Pat, says all you need is a little gun training, and life is wonderful, right? I did not say that. The I was visiting uh, my friend's house. You remind my, me of Jeremy Corbett. My friend's house from college, and yeah, and I was looking at the big glass doors, and went out in the backyard. And I noticed there's a, a hole through the door. And I said, what happened? He said, well, I had my handgun out. And it went off inadvertently. Uh, if you go on the internet, there's all sorts of collections of people who sensibly have been trained in armaments uh, in, with gun accidents. And the third category the other category is the people very often are giving lectures on different types of guns and so forth, and inadvertently, these are doing a lecture now, it goes off and puts a hole. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so these are these are weapons. These, these are things you know. There are other tragic episodes of people who get shot by a do their own dog. <laughs> people have guns and vehicles, and it has happened. The dog will, and the classic one. This is absolutely true. When I lived on the reservation, a guy was in the basement. I always thought this would never happen, but. He actually was mucking around with his guns and his bells in his, his basement, and the bullet went up to the second floor. And 
injured another resident of the family, not seriously, but that's what I mean. You're going to bring this into your house, you know, uh, let the, and by the way, it's called correlation, oh. very simply. It does not right. establish, co does not, does not, it does not establish causality, but anyhow, I, anyhow, training does not eliminate the danger. I guess it might minimize it somewhat. Um, but I, I actually had, one thing I did learn was rust, though. Uh, the gun sales thing, um, the Brady Group, if anything, is, and the, the Illinois moms are trying to go after the gun sales, which apparently remain un, un, um, uncontrolled at best. People buy guns. I think more guns are sold outside of a gun show than in it or something like that. Uh, the private sales. Yeah, um, the masses of numbers of the gun dealers, if you looked up the place of business, it was their place of residence. These guys don't own any gun shops and things like that. Um, I think until we get uniformity in these, and it's got to be nationwide uniformity uh, to preclude the loophole. Uh, from people getting it. And the last of all, the one thing, I, we could never understand this, and I guess it's someone talking to yourself, the political party people in my union, these were machinists, and the, the political director could never understand why people, when guys would vote for candidates strictly that they were against gun control above all other issues. He said economic issues didn't matter to them. Job security didn't matter. But he said maybe yeah. they just weren't thinking yeah. or the NRA had captured them, trained them sufficiently. But he, he had the hardest time trying to dealing with, they tried various approaches to say this is not the single most important issue in life. Believe you me, the economic security of providing for your family and job security isn't more important. I guess it was too complex to understand. Or they got a good deal. I guess they can handle that. But that's basically <laughs> it. Um, like, I guess there is a certain percentage of the core people that you're just never going to reach. Or maybe they're beyond hope or something like this. And by the way, I still don't believe, I still don't understand this. She told the story, you tell us people like burglars come in house. Burglars don't want people in houses, as far as I know. That's true. So they, the one thing, they will not, if there's people there, they disappear. The other thing about concealed carry is, chances are the guy left, but you're not going to do any, your chances of pulling a gun out and getting somebody assailant are virtually nil. You're not going to shoot them. You're probably going to right. You're probably just going to exacerbate the situation. And by the way, every single use of concealed carry brings a, a legal cost on average. By the time you get out of the courts, of about a hundred thousand dollars, regardless of the situation. And you absolutely there's some legitimate reason to say that. If you want to have weaponry, you better have insurance. Thank you. All right. All right. Yeah, there are people who need okay. lost them on the okay, internet. Quick three minutes. Huh? Uh, they shoot each other all the time. All right, Andy, three minutes and close yeah. us out. Uh, once again, um, we're still in the rebuttal period. There's a bunch period. of articles uh, on common dreams. Uh, Louder, a Andy. Books, a bunch of articles coming out. Bunch of books that are uh, in print right now uh, coming out talking about the, the total assault and the war on the middle class that's going on with the billionaires that have been appointed to masquerade as politicians running our government. We outnumber those people uh, by over a thousand to one. That's being pointed out by a lot of authors. Uh, the American public is rapidly waking up. It's like getting a giant finger jammed down your throat and you're gagging on it. Well, Donald Trump is the ultimate finger. There's no question about that. He gets the ultimate and, finger. Uh, he gives people the finger. 
he, he appoints people that like to give the finger to anybody. If your child needs medicine, if you don't have the money, tough, let them die. Uh, right. These people, many of them, uh, have been involved in crimes that have uh, resulted in uh, death and destruction all over the world. And as I said, the world is waking up. Uh, you, all you have to do is log on to some of the websites and look what look at the posters that people are putting up in Germany and France. I forget uh, which country it was in. They put up a big poster on the side of Parliament building and said, Mr. Trump, fuck you. <laughs> and uh, sure. the rest of the world is saying, uh, Mr. Trump, fuck off. Uh, we're going ahead with trying to protect the climate. We're going ahead with universal health care, universal education. It's just the opposite of all the different policies that uh, this criminal... We're, we're looking at a huge crime spree of criminals appointed to run our government and uh, many of the analysts, I've heard this term like about a dozen different times in articles the last four weeks or so, called Robin Hood in reverse. This is uh, their, their job. The, the people that are running our government right now see their, their one and only job is to shovel money to billionaires and take as much away from the poor and the middle class as they can, as fast as they can, before the public finally comes after them, one way or another. So uh, the public is... You know, people are waking up, and there's tremendous amount, you know, millions of people are involved in the nationwide educational movement. It's more clear than ever. I've been talking about this for 20 years. The major media now try to maintain us in a bubble of ignorance. We don't have investigative reporters on any of the major news stations anymore like we used to. Remember when we used to have investigative reporters back, you know, 30, 40 years ago? We still used to. He said, but not, not to the extent that you had, you know, back 30, 40 years ago. There's all kinds of things that reporters okay. don't have time to investigate. So uh, it's up to us as citizens to help people learn. And now it spreads, just like in Galileo's time, from person to person, people talking to each other. So keep up the good work, people, and help your friends and neighbors learn. Okay. Uh, thank you. Close this out. All right, that's it for the College of Complexes on hey, what June 3rd. Hopefully we'll see you all next week. Anybody, anybody else, else want to do a rebuttal? No, I guess that's you want, it. You want, you want to go? Go ahead. Just a real short one. I probably forget most of my points. Get up there, which, Gruber, number 20. <laughs> anyway, well, this has been a very interesting session. A topic that's always a hot topic. I contend that it's really not an important topic, and that really gets people angry because it doesn't really affect most of us. Most of us will never be the victim of a gun crime or anywhere near it. But somebody pointed out, Tim pointed out, that the gun deaths are very low, a few hundred a year in Australia, almost non-existent in Scandinavia. I think it's very simple why. They have their just much more liberal attitudes towards sex. And, you know, if people are getting laid, they're not out shooting each other. <laughs> All right. All right, Mr. Bumper, close us out with a good... I really can't hope to top that. I've, I've long believed that uh, when you are getting laid, you can't do any mischief. Therefore, I suggest we have a new version of the Peace Corps. <laughs> Under my proposal, we would have volunteers from all of the countries of the world <laughs> volunteering to go to other countries and showing the leaders of these other countries better ways to spend their time. <laughs> you know, we have all, we have all hoped and prayed for a just and lasting peace. Now this is one way of bringing about that peace all men seek. Thank you. <laughs> now close us out, Andy. Okay. Now we'll make it official. That's uh, a wrap up for June 3rd. The weirdest college of all This is the weird, weirdest uh, one night we had in a long, long time. So everybody bring their creative thoughts for next week just in case we have a repeat. Yeah. Uh, there you go, Gruber. Uh, yeah.